Welcome to week two of Advanced Pharmacology. This week we'll be starting to talk about uh, special populations. These will include the geriatric patients, the pediatric patients, as well as women who are pregnant or nursing. Older adults make up 14% of the population, yet account for 30% of medical medication expenditures. Among a national sample of 2,950 older adults, 12% took 10 medications daily, 23% of the patients took 5 prescription medications daily. The most common drug classes that were found include cardiovascular, analgesics, and central nervous system drugs. So why is this happening to our ger geriatric patients? Um, many of the geriatric patients see multiple providers. They self-medicate themselves with over-the-counter medications as well as vitamins and home remedies. And they have a polypharmacy in which they are taking multiple medications um, that the provider is, that the different providers are not aware of. Um, this increases their risks for adverse drug reactions. Um, this is also due to limited knowledge of impact of the specific drugs on the older adults, polypharmacy as well, and normal age and disease associated changes. These um, increase the risk for geriatric patients um, to have adverse drug reactions. Research has demonstrated that, a num that the number of pills taken daily more close closely correlates to adverse drug reactions than the number of prescription medications um, taken by the uh, patient. Um, most drug studies are done on individuals, however, um, 55 years of age or younger. It's very difficult to um, study both geriatric as well as pediatric uh, patients. A 2011 Center of Disease Control and Prevention study in the New England Journal of Medicine indicated that warfarin, insulin, oral antiplatelet drugs and oral hypoglycemic agents were responsible for more than two-thirds of emergency hospital admissions among people aged 65 years and older. We don't um, think of insulin or um, hypoglycemic agents as dangerous for our elderly patients. However, um, obviously from this study, um, we're seeing that um, Either it's related to um, the way that they're taking the medication or they're not taking the medication. So what um, can we do to prevent this? The functional assessment is the core concept in, of geriatrics. When one is evaluating elderly patients, it's important to assess their ability to function in addition to what medical illnesses they may have. Um, it's important for providers to evaluate the medications for efficacy as well as adverse drug reactions and functional status. As patients get older and become um, elderly, there's changes in the way in which the body handles medications. Um, and it's suggested that you should start low and go slow in the elderly patient. So what type of um, functional expression should we look for? Um, that will increase the risk for geriatric patients um, to um, have adverse drug reactions. Once the medication has started, it's essential to evaluate for the efficiency, e efficacy of the drugs and for adverse drug reactions. 
Evaluations must include any changes in the functional status of the patient that may be a result from medications. Common expressions of functional decline include weight loss, decline in mobility, incontinence, as well as falls. We see this frequently in elderly patients, and this is an expression of, of their functional decline. So what can we do to assess um, the patient's risk for having um, adverse drug re reactions or um, tolerating their medications? Well, there are a number of uh, assessment tools out there. However, Edmonds talks about the CATS activities of daily living, which, is assesses, which assesses mobility in the elderly patient in their ADLs, and the Folstein Mini Mental Status Exam. This exam assesses cognitive fun function in the, in the elderly patient. So let's talk about the pharmacokinetics um, and the changes that affect drug therapy in the geriatric patient. There appears to be um, little, if any, significance in the amount of drug absorbed when drugs are passively absorbed by the geriatric patient. However, some reduced absorption has been noted in older adults for some co compounds that are actively absorbed, such as galactose, calcium, thiamine, and iron. There are physiological changes that affect absorption of actively absorbed drugs. This includes reduction in the, out, in the acid output and subsequent alkaline environment of the stomach. Um, for example, vitamin B12 requires an acid medium for absorption. So we'll see a great uh, number of elderly patients with, a B, with vitamin B12 deficiency. And this is related to the alkaline environment in the stomach. There's also reductions in blood flow, enzyme activity, gastric emptying, and bowel motility, which also support the delay of absorption of some drugs. If any of you have cared for elderly patients, you'll, you'll all know that the elderly patient does have uh, slow bowel motility and slow gastric emptying, so they become constipated a great deal of time. There's also a change in the rate of absorption that results in alterations in the motility and the rate of gastric emptying. Some of these are caused by disease processes, such as congestive heart failure or GI tract diseases, but more often these are produced by the actions of medications themselves. Cathartics can increase GI motility, and thereby increase the rate at which another drug passes through the GI tract. This can be a problem for enteric coated products. Similar, similarly, anticholinergics decrease motility, and um, many drugs stimulate motil motility, thereby altering the rate of drug absorption with some medications. Um, this occurs with levodopa, tetracycline, and acetaminophen. Food can also de delay or reduce the absorption of certain drugs, um, and this is particularly true with antibiotics. In the elderly patient, again, the elderly have changes in the way in which the body handles medications. Um, again, dosing advice is to start low and go slow. So what do we know about a distribution in the geriatric patient? Well, changes in the total body water and lean body mass in older adults may result in a limited distribution of the drugs to these areas. For this reason, unadjusted dosing can result in increased serum concentrations, leading to enhanced effect or toxicity. You must consider common aid changes. Again, the decline in total body water, body mass, lean versus fat, and decrease the 
the increase in fat can result in an increase in the volume of distribution of lipid soluble drugs leading to drug accumulation and potential for toxicity. For example, certain drugs such as Valium, the other name for Valium is diazepine, have a higher volume of distribution than do other anti-anxiety agents such as lorazepam and oxypam because of their lipid solubil solubility. The drug dis distribution is dependent on any of these variables um, and can cause enhanced effect, toxicity. Um, older adults also have a decrease in serum albumin. Um, since albumin concentrations decrease slightly with age in most elderly pa patients, um, this isn't a problem. However, significant changes that may affect drug therapy is seen in the chronically ill or malnourished elderly patients. These patients have very low albumin levels. And albumin is the most common protein that binds the various acidic drugs. So if they have a decrease in albumin, they, this results in a greater free concentration of highly protein-bound drugs and, again, can cause toxicity. Generally, drugs that are highly protein-bound to albumin should be prescribed in reduced doses for patients with low serum albumin levels. Um, there are some common examples in Edmund's book, boxes 4.1 through 4.3, that you might want to take a look at. So let's all next talk about um, changes in geriatric patients related to um, biotransformation or metabolism. Aging influences loss of hepatic reserve. There is a significance of hepatic blood flow changes that may be seen with drugs that have a high extraction ratio or high first pass metabolism in the liver. When flow is reduced, as which occurs with aging, less drugs metabolize and increased amounts may be present in the active form in the blood. Lower doses for these medications may be necessary. Again, this is related to declining mass of the liver, decreased hepatic blood flow, an alteration in the nutritional status, and other physiological changes and diseases that occur in the elderly patient. So um, looking at the different phases, phase one metabolism is primarily affected in the geriatric um, patients. Drugs that are metabolized by phase one pathways, including the cytochrome P450 enzyme systems, um, may accumulate in the older adult. Example of drugs that undergo phase one metabolism include lidocaine, propanolol, and theophylline. Um, drugs that are metabolized and excreted by the liver should be started at 30 to 40% less than the average dose of an uh, adult. So what about excretion? What changes do we see in the elderly patient um, or geriatric patient um, related to excretion? Well, age-related changes in the renal function are, most are the most important physiologic factor that re results in adverse drug reactions. These changes include a decreased number of nephrons, decreased renal blood flow, glomular filtration rate, and tubular secretion rate. There's also increased number of sclerosis glomeruli. This, these all result in decreased creatinine clearance. The, if um, the kidneys aren't working well, then you're not going to be able to excrete these drugs and levels are going to become elevated and can become toxic. The patient's unable to um, get rid of um, or excrete the drugs through the urine. Excretion um, can be caused by chronic diseases as well. Um, chronic, chronic diseases affect uh, renal function and can further complicate required dosing. 
the gold standard um, for looking at renal function is creatinine clearance. And gold standard for testing this is a 24-hour urine collection. So you should think about um, ordering this prior to starting medications in your geriatric patients who um, whose renal function is necessary for um, excretion. Creatinine clearance is um, calculated in by using the modified Cockcroft Galt equation. However, many of the labs um, these day in the hospitals as well as um, regular labs provide this um, result for you. However, um, the book does show you how to uh, calculate this. In men, the creatinine clearance is equal to the weight in kilograms times 140 minus the age in years. This is all divided by 72 times the serum creatinine. And this will give you the creatinine clearance in men. In women, it's a little different. You, weigh, you take the weight in kilograms times 140 minus the age in years and then divide this by 72 times the serum creatinine. But that result, you multiply by 0.85. And this will give you the creatinine clearance for women. Now, um, what, um, else, what can we do um, to think about, or how can we think about the uh, pharmacodynamic changes in elderly that may affect drug um, therapy? Well, in, we know that in the elderly patient, the receptor affinities or number decreases. The hormonal levels affect this. Central nervous system and cardiovascular systems. Aging and altered homeostatic mechanisms in the elderly may increase sensitivity to many of the drugs we prescribe. It may result from changes in drug receptors associated with aging or may be caused by reduced reserve capacity in the aged patient. Contributing factors um, for increased sensitivity in the central nervous system include decreased um, neural numbers, decreased cerebral blood flow, increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier, and decreased neurotransmitters. These all occur as we age. Example of this is drugs um, with anticholinergic side effects. Commonly reported adverse side effects include sedation, confusion, orthostatic hypotension, constipation, dry mouth, urinary retention, tachycardia, and blurred vision. Benzodiazepines um, can cause uh, benzodiazepine-induced psychomotor impairment um, where the elderly patient becomes a toxic, they have a delayed reaction time, have increased body sway, and decreased proprioception. Now when you think about elderly patients and we give them medications that increase um, delayed reaction time, and increased body sway, um, you know, you can figure that they are pretty much um, increasing their risk for falling. Um, so this is very important when prescribing, especially benzodiazepines, to the old elderly patient. There's also age-related cardiovascular changes that um, results that may result in receptor sensitivity. The loss of baroreceptor response and failure of cerebral blood flow autoregulation lead to orthohypos tension in the elderly patients. Consequences of orthostatic hypotension include dizziness and increased risk for falls and fractures. These, um, this can be aggravated by drugs with symphalytic activity. So let's look at um, common concerns uh, for the geriatric patients. Again, one of the major um, concerns is adverse drug reactions. They occur higher in the older adult, and they increase exponentially with four or more drugs that the patient takes. Um, however, these elderly patients have chronic diseases, and a reduction in the number of medications may not be an option for them. Um, 
research has shown that the average older adult uses 4.5 prescriptions and two over-the-counter medications daily. Um, older adults may add supplements and vitamins at home and various home remedies. And many of these drugs are, are taken or prescribed inappropriately. Um, it's very important to um, look at complementary and alternative medications that your elderly patient may be taking. Because if we need to reduce the number of medications, it may um, involve reducing these. The use of multiple medications increases the risk of drug-to-drug -drug interactions, adverse reactions, and exacerbation of their medical problems. Um, especially with the complementary and alternative medications such as herbs, many of these products are not rigid, rigidly regulated. It's difficult to assess the likelihood of drug-to-drug -drug interactions. There can be toxic effects or side effects that the elderly patient is unaware of. For this reason, the older adults need to be educated about the potential inter drug interactions and side effects of many of the complementary and alternative medications that they may be taking. Providers should be alerted to the prevalent use of these products among their patient population and also they need to assess for these medications. A lot of times the elderly patient doesn't feel that uh, an herb or a vitamin is a medication that needs to be reported. So it's important for the provider to um, ask and assess for these medications. Another um, concern in the geriatric patient is adherence uh, to the medication regimen. Um, this is to the extent to which a patient follows a planned medical regimen. Um, drug non-adherence takes many forms. It can include deliberate omission of medications in which the patient um, feels that they don't really need this medication or unintentional and intentional intentional overdosing in which um, the patient either feels that if one works then two would work better and they might double their dose or feel that um, or they don't know what each medication is for and they can take the wrong medication. There can be errors in dosing frequency. The use of medications other than those um, that the provider intended incorrect mode of administration, and use of drugs prescribed by another individual. More barriers um, to adherence include cost. Um, for elderly patients, uh, their copay may be so expensive that they can't afford. Um, if they have insurance, to pay the copay to, to get their medications, or some of them don't have any. Um, insurance and they can't afford the medications. A lot have complicated or unrealistic schedules. If you've ever taken antibiotic four times a day, um, you know that this is very difficult to do. This is especially true for the elderly or geriatric patient. Many of these patients have impaired cognition or judgment and are unable to remember to take their medications. Many of the elderly patients um, don't like the side effects. Some of these medications make them dizzy. Some of these medications um, cause nausea, and they don't like to take these, and they will not take the medications because of the side effects. There's also a lack of knowledge related to the need or purpose of the medication. Many, If you ask a geriatric patient um, what each of their medication is for, I suspect half of the medications they take, they don't even know what they're taking them for. There's also uh, the fear of side effects or exacerbations of other problems by taking um, their medications. They might fear that um, it's going to make their um, condition worse. And some patients don't see a perceived response or effect from the drug therapy, so they feel that it's not working. A lot of patients who take beta blockers don't see a, um, or feel a change in the way um, in, in their disease process. Um, however, this is a preventive, um, a lot of times it's preventative, so they, they don't 
really perceive the effect from the drug therapy and feel that they don't need it because it's not doing anything for them. These are the um, barriers to adherence that um, you need to explain to your patients. So what is um, the, a process model of prescribing for an elderly patient? Um, you really need to review the clinical indications being addressed by the, prescri by the prescription. Does this patient really need it? What are the clinical indications for prescribing this medication? Why use a drug? Why should this particular drug be used? And why should this drug not be used? These are the questions that you should be asking yourself prior to prescribing medication to the elderly patient. Is a clear link evident between the drug being considered and the disease entity being treated? Um, you need to determine whether the goal of medication therapy is to cure, manage future risks from the condition, or provide comfort for the patient. You also need to obtain a some baseline data, such as the CATS or the ADLs. Um, there's mini mental status exams. So you need to have a baseline so you can judge whether this medication is making your symptoms better or worse. Decisions should be made with the use of st statistically significant outcome data that, sh that shows proven clinical and quality of life benefits for adding these medications to your patient's regimen. Um, you must consider availability as well as cost and dosing schedules. Once a day medications are much easier for elderly patients to take and remember than taking, having to take a medication four times a day. You need to review potential contraindications, side effects, and toxicities, as well as other reasons why this drug might not be a good therapeutic choice for your elderly patient. You need to specifically evaluate with respect to past and current medical problems that can influence the risk or benefits of a particular drug therapy. Consider a review of all potential drug-to-drug -drug and herb-to-drug interactions for your patients who take a variety of prescribed and over-the-counter therapies. So next, let's take a quick look at um, special populations, including pediatric patients. Many um, providers are um, concerned about providing um, prescriptions to um, children. It seems that um, you know the children and infants are so um, small, and medications can make a big difference in their um, their condition, and a lot of people uh, feel uncomfortable. So what's involved in uh, drug therapy in infants and children? So determining how to give medications to children involves an understanding of the various physiologic factors that may be affected by these drugs, the pharmacokinetics. Information must be mastered for each age group that makes up pediatric the pediatric category. For example, preterm infants, their gestational lay age is less than 36 weeks. Their pharmacokinetics is different than the neonates who are, le who are birthed to less than 30 days of age. They are different from infants, um, and those are, infants are considered 1 to 12 months. Toddlers are considered one to four years, children are four to 12 years, and adolescents are greater than 12 years. So you need to look at the pharmacokinetics of drug therapy in each of these age groups prior to prescribing. So first, let's look at drug absorption. Um, physiological status affects blood flow, which affects absorption at the site of the parental drug administration. In premature infants with little muscle mass, 
perfusion um, to these areas and the resulting absorption are extremely irregular. If larger children, in larger children, more rapid absorption occurs um, in different muscles of the body. For example, the deltoid muscle um, is, has rapid absorption versus um, the vastus lat lateralis muscle, whereas medications are absorbed the slowest from the gluteal muscles. Um, peripheral vas vasomotor instability thermal instability and reduced muscular contraction in contractions in premature infants compared with older children and adults also influence uh, drug absorption, um, especially from the intramuscular sites. Um, in neonates, there's um, changes of status in the status of their GI function. For example, in the first weeks of life, the intestine is highly permeable and premature babies may absorb substances that cannot penetrate the more mature intestine. Um, and these fluctuating GI function from, neonatal, from the neonatal period to about eight months affects most enteral administrations. Uh, the presence of amniotic fluid in the stomach um, causes uh, the an alkaline pH environment during the days after birth. Although neonates quickly develop acidic gastric environment, they do not produce normal levels of gastric acid until somewhere between the ages of three and seven years. And as we know from the first um, week of class, uh, Gas, uh, as acidic uh, environments are very important for absorption of um, many of the drugs. Again, um, trans. Oops, sorry. Um, trans. Trans. Um, dermal permeability is enhanced in premature infants. Um, So you need to be careful with um, anything that um, is trans transdermally. I think I'm on the wrong slide here. I'm sorry. No, nope, I'm right. Um, trans um, in in both prematures and newborns. Um, there's also the drug absorption may um, be delayed or increased to a greater extent than anticipated because of the absence of intestinal flora or reduced enzyme function, um, delays in gastric emptying, deficiencies in transport mechanisms across neonatal intestinal membrane, membranes, or slow GI transit. The stomach um, begins to empty more quickly once the infant's is six to eight months of age, and this is when um, feeding really begins uh, solid foods. At that time, um, the GI transit may become faster and more unpredictable. So this is another consideration uh, you must make when um, prescribing medications to um, young neonates. Rectal suppositories um, are often avoided um, in drug administration, administration primarily because children don't retain the dosage for long enough to receive the entire dose. So you don't really know how much of the drug the patient is getting. Um, this is especially true in the early weeks of life where um, the neonate has multiple bowel movements a day. So if you're giving a suppository, you don't know how much they're really getting. So let's look at drug um, distribution in infants and children. The distribution volumes of drugs in the child vary as the body composition changes through growth and development. Neonates um, have a higher proportion of body weight, and this is in the form of water than in the adult. They have reduced percent of fat, in pre especially in premature infants, and 
plasma protein binding in neonates is comparatively low. Drugs are distributed in breast milk of breastfeeding mothers, and these may pose problems for infants. They have to be very careful of, uh, the mother has to be very careful of what they're taking in because many of the um, drugs are distributed, uh, distributed in the breast milk and can pass um, to the infant. In premature infants, incomplete um, development enhances permeability of the blood-brain barrier and permits drugs and bilirubin to enter the CNS more readily. This is why we see um, a higher um, effect from um, bilirubin in the um, premature infant. Drug metabolism is slower in infants um, than older children and adults. And they also have slow clearance rates and prolonged half-lives. For this reason, we have to be very careful of um, what we prescribe, how much we prescribe, and um, because these two can become toxic um, and cause adverse drug reactions. Let's um, look at drug excretion. Uh, the glomular filtration rate is only 50% of that of the adult um, by about the third week of life. The, G, uh, the glomular filtration rate does not reach adult value till about six months of age. So those medications that should be excreted um, we expect their half life to excrete it by the expectant um, amount by their half life is half of what um, should be expected. So the drug stays around longer um, and can cause changes, um, can cause toxicity as well as um, higher levels. Changes in urinary pH also affect excretion, and this can be seen in, in um, young children. So how do we choose a drug regimen? Um, we need to consider um, many different aspects in um, prescribing for um, infants, neonates, infants, as well as children. We must consider the formulation. Is it a pill? Is it a liquid? Is it a suppository? Again, uh, suppositories are hard to judge how much uh, medication the um, young infant um, or neonate receives because of the frequent um, passage of stool. We also have to consider the vehicle of delivery. Is uh, the parent going to use a dropper, a teaspoon, or a cup? Are they going to be able to measure this appropriately? Do you need to provide them with a, um, a more appropriate measuring um, vehicle, such as a syringe? You must consider the taste. If a young child does not like the taste of the drug, they're not going to take it. Um, no matter how many times you try, they're going to spit it out. You have to be very um, cognizant about drugs to avoid in children. These include such drugs as tetracycline, which stains the permanent teeth when administered to children younger than nine years of age. You need to um, avoid codeines. Um, or poor antitussives for infants who are vulnerable to respiratory dis depression. This is because a CYP2D6 um, converts codeine to morphine, and this enzyme is not developed in very young babies. The patient um, can become toxic, um, develop respiratory depression, and um, get into some big trouble. Aspirin has to be avoided um, in young children. It's been found to be associated with Rye syndrome and valproic acid. Um, there's been a higher incidence of liver toxicity found in children younger than two years of age. We also have to think about adverse drug reactions in children. Children may be exposed to drugs likely to provide adverse reactions in three ways. This can occur transplacentally, in which um, the mom um, 
takes medications during her pregnancy and can cause it can be transferred through the placenta um, to the fetus and cause drug reactions. It can occur by uh, direct administration of a drug to a child. Um, they can have a drug adverse uh, drug reactions as elderly um, or geriatric patients do. They are more sensitive to the drugs or by ingestion of the drug in breast milk after administration of a drug to a nursing mother. Um, you have to be very careful of what you prescribe to a breastfeeding mom um, that can affect uh, the, the infant if she is nursing. Studies have generally found that the rate of adverse reactions is equal to that in adults. Um, the rate may be 5.8% of drugs administered to children, although the rate is higher if the child is hospitalized rather than ambulatory. Um, and that seems, you know, it's hard to believe that you know, in a hospital environment, why would um, a child be more at risk for having an adverse drug reaction? Um, because those medications that we would give to a child in a hospital, we normally would not give to a patient on an outpatient basis. Um, and that is where um, we get into the trouble of adverse drug reactions. So how do we calculate pediatric dosages um, for young children? The best um, source is the package insert. This is provided by the manufacturer and it is the best source for pediatric dose recommendations. However, there are many um, uh, resources out there um, that you can look up um, the suggested dosage. Um, this, is, this includes up-to-date, um, so many people are using Apocrates uh, on their um, iPhones and uh, you can get a good um, source of information about dosing. However, um, if um, these inserts or doses are not available, proper dosing is calculated based on weight, age, or sur body surface area. So um, what are the rules for calculating pediatric dosages? Um, they're based on age. One form is based on age. Young's rule, which is mentioned in um, Edmund's text, is used for children to ages 2 to 12 years old. Um, what this is, is you take the adult dose times the age of the child divided by the age of the child plus 12. There's also Fred's rule, um, and this is used for infants and children less than two years old. And what this, uh, how to calculate this is um, by taking the infant's age in months, dividing it by 150 times the adult dose. There's also Clark's rules, and this um, is a pediatric dosage rule based on weight. You take the adult dose and you times it by the child's weight divided by 150. Uh, Clark's rule is um, using weight is usually more accurate than a rule based on age. And that makes sense. You, you know, if the child weighs 50 pounds versus uh, 100 pounds, um, you're going to want to go with an age out of weight-based um, calculation versus an age-based calculations. However, many of the um, over-the-counter medications are given, uh, dosages are given according to ages, um, but they do also list the milligrams um, per dose per kilogram on the package inserts. Um, so the pediatric formulation um, variables, what um, considerations must we look at? Um, so tablets, capsules, and powders. These are solid oral dosing forms. 
and these cannot cross the GI membrane until they've been dissolved in the GI fluids. So for those young um, neonates, if their um, stomachs are more alkaline, you're not going to get that, um, that absorption um, through the stomach. They're not going to dissolve these medications. Elixirs um, and suspensions. Elixirs are more of an alcoholic uh, solution in which the drug molecules are dissolved and evenly dis distributed. In the elixirs, there's no shaking that's required. And unless some of the vehicle has evaporated, the full dose of the, um, from the bottle and the, the first dose from the bottle and the last dose of the bottle should contain equivalent amounts of drugs. However, with suspensions, these contain non-dissolved particles of drugs, and they must be dis, um, distributed throughout the vehicle by shaking it. If uh, the suspension is not um, shaken, then the medication at the top of the bottle will be have less uh, amounts of drug in it than that of the um, bottom of the bottle. So if a child is given um, the bottle, the bottom of the bottle, they may be getting a toxic dose. Um, administration of the medication uh, through a buccal or sublingual roots, um, this is a good form um, because it avoids drug destruction uh, by GI fluids in the liver. You don't get that first pass effect. However, the effectiveness of this form depends on whether the child is old enough to keep the drug in contact with the membrane um, or whether he, can, he or she can refrain from swallowing or chewing the tablet until it's completely uh, dissolved. And pediatric suppositories, again, um, and rectal solutions are common forms of drug administration, especially in the neonates. However, however absorption in the um, older child is very slow and is highly unreliable and may produce a substantial bowel irritation. And again, it's very difficult to judge how much of the drug um, the young infant um, has received if they're having frequent bowel movements. Um, pediatric patients do um, receive inhalers, especially for asthma. Um, it's important to remember to provide a spacer because they have difficulty coordinating using these inhalers. And at least with the spacers, they can get um, most of the medication. And other um, medications are ophthalmic medications are um, pretty easy to um, use with all ages. So what is the status of drug dosing and policies regarding children? So research on drug dosing for children. Um, in 1995, the American Academy of Pediatrics reported that only a small proportion of all drugs and biologic products marketed in the United States had clinical trials performed in pediatric patients. Well, this makes sense because nobody wants to trial um, drugs on pediatric patients when they're so sensitive to the medications. Um, so this results that resulted in most marketed drugs were not labeled for use in pediatric patients um, or for use in specific pediatric age groups. So they had to judge how much of a medication was given and um, it really wasn't marketed um, for pediatric patients, patients. There's also um, special compliance problems in children. These variables are attributed to adherence. Um, it's very important for the parent to have a conscientious effort to follow the directions. Um, it can, there can be measuring errors or spilling. A lot of the children will spit the medication out, again, if they don't like the taste of it, or just because they don't want to take something. Um, this is where it's very important to provide parent and children, child education. If you can um, educate the child of how important it will be to take this medication, um, then that's half the battle, as well as the parent.
So let's um, move on to um, pregnant and nursing women. So how, man, how many um, drugs are taken during pregnancy? Well, research has shown that 90% of pregnant women take greater than one prescription drug during pregnancy. It also has shown that the average patient uses five to nine different drugs during pregnancy. And 65% of the women admit to self-administration of drugs during pregnancy. And this is very concerning because a lot of these drugs will pass the placenta and um, the fetus will be affected. And what types of effects um, occur? Well, um, 200,000 birth defects still occur annually. 5% um, five, five of these birth defects are attributed to drugs. However, only 19 drug groups were identified as problem, probable agents um, causing these um, birth defects in humans. Uh, there's a great chart in um, Edmonds on uh, Table 6.1 that does um, talk about these drug groups. Amongst a thousand known um, drugs that do cause malformations, um, they have been identified in laboratory animals. However, most data comes from experience and observation. There's, again, no real scientific research um, because of um, the ages of the children. There's a, another good um, resource for this in Edmonds on um, Box 6.1. Um, you can take a look at that as well. So um, let's look at one example of this. Um, the tragedy that occurred in the 1960s. This medication, thalidomide, um, was a CNS depressant. However, it was found to be very um, effective. It was a sedative hypnotic agent um, that was found to be very effective in reducing nausea and vomiting in pregnancy, especially um, in the um, first trimester where most of the um, nausea and vomiting occurs due to the, due to the um, hormone levels. However, they found that 8,000 to 10,000 birth defects worldwide um, was related to this medication and this forced uh, the attention of the scientific community as well as the lay community, community um, women and, and families on the question of drug safe gain pregnancy. For this reason, um, drugs now have pregnancy ratings. Uh, you can see this on table 6.2. Um, uh, what's important to realize that the most critical period in which drug exposure should be avoided is the embryonic period. This occurs from weeks 3 through 8, during which most of the um, organs are developing and the risk of inducing major um, malformations is greatest. After um, this period, the organ structure, structures continue to grow and mature um, weeks nine through term, but during this period, which is seven, seven, during the fetal period, which is 57 days to term, major malformations are not likely to occur. But organ systems formed during the uh, embryonic period may be damaged by exposure during the second and third trimester. Um, two medications that are not um, found to be safe in pregnancy. Um, so what are these ratings? Well, the safest medication um, to take during pregnancy is uh, rated A. Um, and this means there's adequate, well-controlled studies in pregnant women uh, that have sh not shown any increased risks of fetal abnormalities the possibility of fetal harm appears to be remote. And I believe most of these drugs are, are, are the vitamins. Um, 
that we know will not cause injury to um, fetal growth. The most common uh, rating is rating B, in which animal studies have revealed no evidence of harm to the fetus. However, no adequate and well-controlled studies in pregnant women have been conducted. Or animal studies have shown adverse effect, but adequate and well-controlled studies in pregnant women have failed to demonstrate this risk to the fetus. These are the uh, very common drugs, such as Tylenol. Um, they're Tylenol is rated um, B, as well as some of the antibiotics. Um, Macrobid um, is often used to treat um, urinary tract infections, I believe, is a rated B. The next rating is C, in which animal studies have shown uh, adverse effects and no adequate and well-controlled studies in pregnant women have been conducted. Um, this is because it's too risky. Um, or no animal studies have been conducted and no adequate or well-controlled studies in pregnant women have been conducted. Um, this is where you give the drugs only if potential benefits justify the potential risk to the fetus. Um, example of this would be asthma um, inhalers. Uh, pregnant women who have asthma that is not well controlled other than using inhalers need to continue to use their inhalers during pregnancy. However, many of these are rated class C. Um, so you need to take a look at the potential benefits um, versus the potential risk to the fetus. If a mother um, is not getting adequate oxygen, then neither is the fetus. We then move on to um, rated uh, rate of D in which studies adequate, well-controlled, or observational in pregnant women have demonstrated a risk to the fetus. However, the benefits of therapy may outweigh the potential risks. This is when you give only the drug if it's needed for a life-threatening situation or serious disease for which safer drugs cannot be used or are ineffective. This is um, an example of this would be when a patient is brought to the emergency department um, in, during trauma, a trauma. Um, you need to outweigh um, the potential risk versus benefits. Um, the, the patient that you need to, there are two patients that you need to um, care for. However, um, the mom is the first concern. Um, and this is when you need to, again, look at the risks versus benefits of giving um, this drug. And finally, there's X, uh, rate, rated X. Um, studies in adequate, well-controlled, or, or observational in animals or pregnant women have demonstrated positive evidence of fetal abnormalities. This is when you use the, pro the use of the product is contraindicated in women who are or may become pregnant. These are drugs that you never use in pregnancy. And you can take a look at the table in um, Edmund's table 6.2. This will give, um, this is demonstrated in that table as well. This is a great um, chart that um, shows of the fetal growth, uh, embryonic uh, to, to throughout the fetal period. And if you look at the um, purple areas, these are the highly sensitive. This is the highly sensitive period in which um, the organs are developing, and um, drugs have the most um, negative effects on the fetus. When you move to these green areas, um, there is less. It's a less sensitive period. However, you still can have injuries um, to the growing organs. For example, during 32 to 30 to, to term, the CNS can be affected. Um, in um, weeks six and a half to eight, um, there can be injury to the heart. Um, so this is a great chart that you can show to your patient as well as um, take a look and um, provide you with uh, information on fetal growth and the effects of 
um, major, major congenital abnormalities as well as functional defects and minor abnormalities related to drug use in pregnancy. Um, so what is the incidence and the type of malformations um, that occur? Again, the most critical period to avoid um, drug exposure is weeks three through eight. Um, there can be placental transfer in which um, the drug is transferred through the placenta to the fetus. Um, there can be maternal fetal genotype. This is when um, maternal absorption, metabolism, and distribution, as well as placental transfer and fetal metabolism characteristics are unique to each fetal um, maternal pair. And this is a result of genetic heterogeneity um, and fetal susceptibility to the potential um, drug that will cause um, malformations. This is easy to understand when you think about clinicians um, who for the same abnormality, some individuals will be susceptible where others will be resistant. For example, um, patients um, who abuse drugs during pregnancy, many times the babies are born um, without any um, abnormalities. However, other times um, they do, they are born. Um, yes, it's related to, it can be related to um, the amount and the type of drug. However, it also can be related to this maternal fetal genotype. There is also a dose response relationship. The amount of medication taken often correlates with the observed response. Aberrant uh, development may range from no effect at low doses to organ specific malformations at intermediate doses to embryo fetal toxicity at high doses. And the extent of damage is also, in, also influenced by the stage of development and the route of administration. If, it's, um, if the patient is an IV drug abuser, um, that is, um, will go more quickly and in higher concentration um, to the fetus than would be um, other routes. Um, there is specificity of the agent, um, the extent of adverse environmental influences on, on developing tissues depends heavily on the agent involved. Some agents have um, greater um, risk than others and um, this results in part from factors such as drug dosing, um, maternal metabolism, and placental transfer. Everyone is different and um, maternal metabolism may be faster in some than others um, and if they're taking high doses of drugs, um, it will depend on um, how heavily, heavily um, the agent is involved. There's also um, drug interactions or polypharmacy. Um, two medications that are administered separately may have different effects on the fetus um, when they're given together. Induction or inhibition of enzyme systems and competition of binding sites caused by the two different drugs may influence the levels of unbound and active um, medications that cause um, abnormalities. Um, again, the, the issue of polypharmacy, um, many drugs can um, affect the fetus and um, they can be used, if, if they're used together, they can give a greater effect or um, one effect um, may be greater than the other due to the unbound and active forms. Um, however, despite the fact that many um, women um, should not take um, medications during pregnancy, there are um, many reasons that they need to. Um, from, there's many uh, physiologic changes um, that um, affects the woman in pregnancies. 
in pregnancy. This includes maternal blood volume. It increases by 30 to 40 percent, which is about 500 to 1800 mils. Um, to support the requirements of the developing fetus, um, this can result in decreased plasma concentrations of some drugs, it decreased albumin and alpha-1 acid uh, glycoprotein concentrations during pregnancy. Um, and this will result in decreased protein binding for highly bound drugs. So you have more um, drugs um, that are not bounded. Um, the renal function improves during gestation. Um, and this is because the renal plasma flow increases by 30%. And the glomular filtration rate increases as well. And this can be increased up to 50%. Because of this um, improved renal filtration, serum urea, creatinine, and uric acid levels usually are decreased in pregnancy. Um, cardiac output increases as much as 32% because of increased heart rate, um, and this can be up to 10 to 15 beats per minute, and increased stroke volume. So there are many physiological changes. However, there are many issues that we need to address in the pregnant um, woman. And these include nausea and vomiting, which usually occurs in the first trimester. Um, many pregnant women are at risk for um, developing uh, UTIs and um, need treatment. A lot of women have asthma prior to, to pregnancy, and this continues throughout pregnancy, and they need to, to use inhalers. Um, some women may um, develop an infection during pregnancy and need antibiotics. Um, some women have epilepsy and they need to be maintained on their um, seizure medications. And we know that many of these are um, can cause injury to the fetus. However, if a, a pregnant woman has a, a seizure, that too can cause injury. Many um, Women can be diabetics, and they need to ma be maintained on their um, medications. Many women have hypertension or develop hypertension during pregnancy and need to ma be maintained on their medications. Um, some women will have a sexually transmitted infection um, and need treatment um, to the point where um, sometimes they have to um, be treated and deliver the baby through C-section, for example, in herpes, where if the um, patient has an active outbreak um, at the time when she's delivering, the baby has to be delivered by C-section. And many women experience depression, and um, it's detrimental to take them off their um, medications, and um, you need to look at the risk versus benefits of um, taking a patient off their antidepressants um, during pregnancy because you also have um, many hormones which can also um, cause changes in moods. Um, and women are at risk um, if you take them off these medications. So what are the medications um, that are that are real are known to be hazards to mothers and their children? Um, Accutane, isotretinone, uh, to known, is um, has been proved to be a hazard um, to both mother and children during pregnancies. There are vaccinations that um, women cannot uh, receive during pregnancies. Um, for example, rubella they should not be vaccinated two months prior to pregnancy or throughout their pregnancy. Uh, pregnant women should avoid caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, and smoking, um, as well as illegal drugs. Um, this has become a major problem in um, the United States today because um, many women are addicted and then they become pregnant and um, they need to continue to take their, medic their, their illegal drugs um, during pregnancy. And then these babies are born um, addicted and have to um, go through withdrawal as well. 
And finally, um, what are the drugs that we um, can um, be at risk um, for breastfeeding mothers? Um, what drugs pass through um, the milk um, to the infant, which uh, increases the risk of toxicity as well as adverse drug reactions um, or injury to the, to the infant? There are some great boxes in Edmonds, boxes 6, 4, and 6, 5, list drugs that have lactation risks um, and categories. There's also um, box 6, 3, in which um, lists considerations for drug use during pregnancy. And um, box table 6, 6 um, is a great reference of when to interrupt or wean drugs for breastfeeding.